sections after the panels in the Opportunity Hall. I know a lot of y'all got your headshots as well. Uh, we're so excited. Thank you all for staying here. You are not going to regret being seated in your seats right now. Right now, I have the joy, the pleasure, and the honor of introducing to you all someone who is actually really special to me. So I'm going to transport you back to 2014 um, when I was a super senior at UC Berkeley. So I double majored in political economy and French. I did a minor in global poverty and practice. I was about to graduate. My plan was that I was either going to apply for a Fulbright, join the Peace Corps. Uh, that's really what I thought I was going to be doing. But what actually happened was in my last semester at Cal, I act, there was a Black Lives Matter protest on my campus that changed the trajectory of my career. It wasn't just the protest, but it was really the conversations that we had afterwards that made me realize that while I was out here trying to go somewhere else to have an impact on the world, I realized that I needed to be in my community and at home because we needed a lot of work to do here. So when I got to that moment, I was lost, right? Because all throughout college, I thought I was gonna go live somewhere else in the world when I graduated. So I didn't know what to do, where to look. So I did what we have been telling you all to do today. I went on LinkedIn. I did not know what I was looking for. I typed in diversity, looking for jobs. I typed in multicultural, some more things came up. And when I did my search, I came across this beautiful smiling face and their title was Multicultural Marketing Manager at Google. I'm like, damn, that sounds like a cool job. Like, I wanna do that, but how do I do that? I had one connection, one person I knew that worked at Google. He had coincidentally just given us a tour of the Google campus that he was working at. And on this tour, he mentioned the cool thing about working at Google is that we have everybody's email address. So I text Michael, the one connection I have at Google, and I say, Michael, I met, well, I found on LinkedIn this person who's a multicultural marketing manager at Google, and I want to meet her. I want to figure out how I can do what she's doing. I don't know what it is, but it sounds really cool. So I draft, he's like, sure, of course, I'll do it. I'll make the connection, draft the email, and I'll forward it. So I draft the email. Hi, my name is Amber, I'm a senior at Berkeley. Can you chat with me for 15 minutes, you know, have a conversation? Um, and Michael forwarded this email, and she responded. So when we finally were able to set up our call, I remember I was actually doing interviews for my successor at the Leadership Center. And I finished, and I was like, I'm going to be ready for the call. And I go, and I get on there, and I remember the first thing she asked, she asked me is, how can I help you? And I was like, I need a job. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I want to do and I don't know how to get there. So what she told me, she's like, all right, go on my Twitter, go on my LinkedIn, go on my Facebook, and follow the things that I'm following that seem interesting to you. And if there's a job opportunity and I can help make the connection, I'll do it. I'm like, cool. About a year after this connection was made, an opportunity opened up to become the executive assistant to the newest CEO at the Latino Community Foundation. And I was able to send that email to her and say, hey, I'm applying for this job. Can you give me, make, help make a connection? And she did. Three and a half years later, I'm now the senior program manager at the Latino Community Foundation. And every year on my anniversary, I email this woman to thank her because I would not be there without her support. It didn't just happen overnight. In that one year that I had been connected with her, I would message her. I said, hey, I wrote this cool poem on women's empowerment. Hey, I just graduated from Cal. Hey, I just got this op-ed published. Hey, I'm working here now. I made sure that I stayed relevant so that the day one year after we made the connection, 
her and I were still connected and I was still relevant and I was still on her radar. Now, I'm happy to say that she's also a friend. We can go dancing together, we can hang out together, but it would have never happened had I been scared to send this cold email to this person that I happened to stumble upon on LinkedIn. I am not working in multicultural marketing at Google, but I do have my dream job. And it would not have been possible without your next keynote speaker, Eliana Murillo. I told her best intro ever of all time. I don't know if anyone else will ever have such a good intro for me because that story is very special. Wasn't that moving? She's so badass and <laughs> relentless and just so committed and so thank you. And thank you to Digital Nest for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you. And I know that it is late in the day and so all of you are troopers and I'm so inspired by you because you've, you've gone through the whole day. And who feels inspired by everything you've learned today? Woo! Who feels like they have some things to go home and do? Like, get on LinkedIn, make an Instagram or something, a professional looking one. Who isn't sure what to do next? I like it. Okay, for the few, but no, you will hopefully by the end of this talk. But I like that the majority of the group does. It's amazing because um, it's really special for me to be here and to be in a space like this with all of you because it's really, really similar to where I grew up. And so I feel like I'm getting taken back to years ago when I was in a very similar place, physically, mentally, uh, professionally. So I'll give you, I'll take you a little bit back into my story and um, I'm gonna ask you to remind me to say something. Just remember the phrase E equals MC squared. Okay, so later I'll say, remind me what I'm supposed to say and that's gonna help me. And at the end I'll tell you what. So I'm from Oxnard, California. Anybody know where that is? Anybody have relatives there? A couple people? So Oxnard is a lot like Watsonville. And I learned this because when I got to college, after going to public school my whole life, I somehow ended up at Harvard because my mom made me apply. And I had never told anyone that I applied because I was afraid they'd make fun of me because people from Oxnard didn't go to schools like Harvard. And definitely not people that look like me, and many of us, right? So at least that's not what I thought I could expect for myself. But I ended up there, and one of the first people I met was my friend Rob Granados. And Rob is amazing and super humble, and it took weeks, if not months, of becoming friends to learn a lot about his story. And I'll, I'll start with him a little bit, because I met him through, a cousin told me that she, my cousin Angelica, said she has a friend on a softball team whose brother's brother is gonna go to Harvard. So it was early days for Facebook, I sent him a message, and, and kind of like Amber, cold email, cold Facebook message, I'm like, Hey, are you this person, this, this, this? And he said, uh, no, that's not me. Because I missed one little link. So he rejected me, I felt totally devastated. This is gonna be my one friend at college when I got there. But anyway, we finally meet, despite him rejecting my message to be friends on Facebook. And I learned that he's from Watsonville and he told me a lot about his community. And I felt like I went to Watsonville High because he told me all about being, like, how they, the, the mascot, the Wildcats with a Z, it's cool, how Martinelli's is across the street. But more importantly than his little details of high school, more about how the demographics exist in this community. Um, an incredibly strong force of farm worker labor, just like in Oxnard. And driving in right now, I live in San Francisco, and I drove in and thought, this is like going home. And it makes me feel, I'm not gonna cry, but I feel sort of emotional thinking about it because it was just a beautiful drive in with fields in every direction. That's what Oxnard's like. And knowing that you're sort of near San Francisco, and you're, I grew up sort of near LA, but we're not the big cities. And in my hometown, we don't have big companies. We have local mom shop, mom and pop shop, small businesses. How many of you know a business owner? Any type. If they're a babysitter, if they own a restaurant, entrepreneurial energy is often thriving in these communities, but it's not gonna be the next headquarters of Amazon or something, you know? It's just very different. So anyway, he was always such an important uh, friend to me, and when I finally came to visit Watsonville, I was so inspired because I thought, wow, like, we both kind of made it out. And I think we both want to come back. Like, I go back to Oxford all the time. My family's still there. But there are not a lot of us that go to college. Not a lot of us that graduate high school to start there. And then college, and then so on and so forth. 
And so it's crazy to me to be here now, and I'm so excited and so honored to be here because this program, Digital Nest, not only is in one of my best friends' hometown, best friends' hometown, which is incredible, but also Digital Nest is a nonprofit that I now have the honor of supporting in a very formal way that I never thought I would do um, growing up. I don't think I'd ever imagined I'd be doing this kind of work outside of work. Um, I'm a part, I'm co-founder of the Latinos in Tech Giving Circle. It's on Google, and I have friends at other tech companies, and we thought, what if we all contribute to nonprofits we care about that are making an impact in the Latino community? So we all contribute, we come together as a circle, and Digital Nest has been awarded multiple years of our grant funding. And I've heard so much about Digital Nest, and I rave about it all the time, and I absolutely love it, and I hadn't been to the Nest yet. So thank you for having me, because it's so meaningful to finally come and meet not only the people that have benefited from it and have helped build it, but to actually be in the space and in this community. How many of you are part of Digital Nest in any capacity? Oh, I love it. You guys are awesome. I'm really, really like, I'm kind of borderline obsessed with you guys. I talk about Digital Nest all the time, and it's amazing. And one of the people who has come into my life more recently is truly a product of Digital Nest, and I really admire his journey, because in the way that Rob and I were able to never forget where we're from, but not be from a big city and still kind of make our way out and navigate this world in a very different way than our families ever did. I met someone from Digital Nest named Martin, who's in the audience, who was a part of the program or kind of co-founded this effort, basically like for day one, one of those day ones of Digital Nest. And through that, built a relationship with Adobe, learned to code, is now working in San Francisco, coding full time. And I just think it's incredible because I don't know that our ancestors thought that we'd be coding one day. That's pretty powerful. No matter where your family comes from, I don't think our grandparents thought we'd be doing what we're able to do now. That you're even at a summit right now doing this work, right? Showing up for yourself on a weekend. That, that's the work. That's the work that gets you further on the weekends. I mean, further along in your career path in the way that we all are thinking, what's the next step when we leave this conference? And so I share that because it's just so inspiring to me to know that people anywhere can have opportunities if we seek them out that where you're from cannot hold you back anymore. Because yes, some people have a running start. But with things like Google and YouTube and plenty of other tech uh, platforms, not, not uh, biased here, <laughs> lots of different products and services out there that can help us learn what we need to learn to get out there. The fact that we can cold email someone. And it's funny because what Amber did is exactly what I did two years ago. So when I got to Harvard, I, um, I learned very quickly that everyone said, from a career standpoint, it's all about who you know. And I was meeting people that were getting internships that I didn't know were supposed to get internships after freshman year. And they called their friend's dad and got hooked up. And I was like, I don't know who I can call. My family doesn't know anybody. So I went home without an internship after freshman year. And so did Rob. He went to Watsonville, came here. I went to Oxnard. And we were just gonna get jobs at home over the summer, I guess. We just didn't really have a plan. And we thought, how do we not know? We were supposed to find an internship in that you know, most people have someone they can just call or just email someone in their network. And so I went home and asked my parents, do we know anybody? Who do we actually know? And so not a lot of people know this part of my story because sometimes, you know, as you live longer, you have to pick the parts that you want to tell to make the story make sense. But this was a really important part of my story because I found out that my dad had one cousin in Mexico who he's like, I think he works at a cheese company. Maybe you can go shadow him. It's like, yeah, I'll go, like, I'll do whatever. I'll show up and sit next to him and just absorb whatever he says. So I call Rob, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, nothing. I'm like, hey, cool, so do you want to go with me to Mexico for like two or three months and just shadow my uncle at this cheese company? I don't know what he does, and I don't know what we're gonna do, but it's something, and maybe we can put on our resume, I hope, and let's just see what happens. So we took that risk, right? We just like, okay, let's save, use our saved up money to fly ourselves to Mexico to Leon Guanajuato, where my dad's family moved. My, my dad has a tia and aunt who has 15 kids. So this is one of those 15, my deal card was. So we spent that summer interning with him, meaning we sat next to him in his office, and every day he was like, go hang out with the county. Go talk to the marketing team, go wherever. And he was really nice and generous at this time, but they'd never had an intern before. And especially, you know, we're, we're Mexican-American, our Spanish is okay. Um, there's moments when we kind of, I think, feel more nervous than other moments, but anyway, it was a really deep immersion into this business, and we learned so much, and it was awesome. And um, anyway, I learned a lot about Watsonville that summer too. So while I was there, I realized, okay, I thought I didn't know anybody, but I had one person I could reach out to to make this happen. 
But most of my friends are in the same place. We don't have parents that have done corporate jobs. We don't have role models that have done this before. And one, they don't look like us, and two, even if, they, even if we have a role model, well, we don't know how to reach out. Like, it's just, just totally disconnected. We're in two different worlds. And, um, and I had seen the movie called What Women Want with Mel Gibson. It's not an Oscar-winning movie or anything, but I loved it because I'd never seen, I'd never, I never knew that it was someone's job to understand how people think and behave and that I could shape a marketing strategy, right? marketing and advertising. I didn't know what that was because my family's not in that space at all. And so I thought, well, everyone on campus is talking about investment banking and consulting. Those are the ways into business. And I had joined the clubs that took us to visit these companies and they sort of wine and dine us and they showed us trade floors and it was all very foreign to me. But I thought, well, I'm glad I got to see it because I actually don't really like it. There are people that you know, and some of you maybe will do that at some point in your life. I'm not judging it, but I'm letting you know that it wasn't a fit for me. But that experience alone was so impactful for me to see, for the first time ever, what it was like to work in that capacity, and just knowing that that's not what I wanted to do was really helpful. Because I almost went through the recruiting process because all my friends were, and I didn't really know otherwise, and I would have probably ended up in one of those roles, which I probably would have died. There's not a fit for me, you know? It's just not at all the way I'm, I'm designed and operate. And, I think a big part of this learning is just knowing who you are and what kind of environment you want to be in. So I thought, well, what if I start a club, because there's all these, all these organizations on campus, what if I start a club for Latinos interested in business, but like interesting business? Because I'm in women in business, and we meet these companies, and they say, we care about diversity. But I was always the only Latina there. So I thought, well, I have other friends that are interested in this too, so I'm gonna start my own club. And I didn't think that was like early stage of entrepreneurship or kind of creating something within uh, an institution already. But I thought, well, if I don't know anyone, then I'm gonna make sure I find connections that can help me and really the community around me. So that summer I'm in Mexico, I'm, I came home from the cheese internship that day and I started just Googling things, just companies and just finding anything I could grasp for in terms of ways to connect with people on the inside. I found random emails on press releases, website contact info, and sometimes it was like someone in finance, someone in anything, like engineering. It could have been any person, and I emailed them. Well, first I got my, my work together. I, I named it, I pieced it all together to make it look like an organization, and I wrote these emails and said, I have a group of 60 really uh, um, ambitious Latino students at Harvard, and we all want jobs, and really all I'm asking is that you talk to us and let us either visit your company or talk to people who work there, just like let us connect in any way. And I had just basically made a list of 60 of my friends and thought, I think we'll join. I think it'll be okay. I'm not really lying. I think they'll be into this because I'm gonna tell them this is how we're gonna get jobs. So then I go back to campus and I had a meeting and all my friends showed up just because I begged them. And I said, I have all these companies on board that wanna hire you. And at this point I had a few, but I had to create my own supply and demand. And eventually they met in the middle. And I had a lot of companies on board that wanted to have us, that invited us to visit. So that was cool. We were welcomed into their offices. Um, I had all these students, and I just, for some reason, I thought, okay, if there's value I'm creating here, I want them to actually value it for themselves. I'm gonna charge them a $10 fee to join this club. That's not a thing. No one paid to join clubs. But I thought, I really wanna take, I want them to take this seriously because I'm putting a lot of my time into this, and I'm not getting paid $10 per kid, but I want this to just be like, set the precedent that this is something that matters and we're investing in ourselves. So with those $10, I paid for $10 per person. I paid for two hotel rooms in New York City. This is totally not kosher. We, I don't know how many bodies we crammed into these rooms. Like it was, I told everyone, pay for your own bus ticket. It was 30 bucks and we all crammed in these hotels and we all went in our little suits and we visited all these companies and we went to BCG Consulting and Macy's and MTV3 at the time, the bilingual station, and we got to visit all these companies where we never would have had an opportunity to be on the inside. We absolutely didn't know anyone there. But it was a really, really cool experience because we were in total shock and just in awe, like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm here. And at MTV3, something really interesting happened. We met with, um, again, my full email, got forwarded around, and then we ended up meeting with like four senior vice presidents. And we could have met with receptionists. Like we were just open to anything, right? We did not expect to have all these people that were so senior at the table. And we're asking questions, and they said, um, we can't believe you're here. And we were like, what? We can't believe you're taking this meeting with us, because we could have talked to anybody, project manager, anybody. And they said, no, we've never met this many ambitious young Latinos all at once. Like, yeah, Harvard's cool, but like Latinos doing anything, period. 
because they all came from places that, you know, there's so many firsts for our community that for them, even us showing up was a big deal. And for us, them showing up was even bigger than we could have ever expected. So through that, a bunch of my friends got really cool jobs. My friend landed a job at Macy's because of that trip. He handed someone his resume, or there's a recruiter in the room, always prepared, right? He had his stuff together. Uh, we did another trip to Chicago for a National Hispanic Association da -da -da at the time conference. And then their friend got a job through a group called SEO. He ended up at JP Morgan. So people's paths were really taking turns that we didn't expect because I just thought, like, well, let's just build our own table because we're not at the main one, right? We're not, we don't see the table, let's build our own table. So through that, two of my friends landed jobs at Google because I had built a relationship with a recruiter. I went to some random recruiting event and I found somebody and I asked for the card and I followed up and I said, I have this group. You know, I'm always kind of directing them my way. And so they took the meeting, we set up this recruiting event, two friends landed internships, and they said, you should really think about interning with Google. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't even do technology. I just thought, I don't code, so what would I do in technology? And they're like, there's so much more, there's HR and advertising and all these different things. And they really sold it to me because they're like, there's free food. Ah. You really need to check it out. I said, okay, fine, you know. So anyway, so I do the internship, I come back full time. And what was really interesting to me was that all along I was kind of building my own table, but one, I was being told, you know, it's who you know, and I was trying to navigate that. But also, two, I was learning how to, how to function in these spaces. Because my high school is 93% Mexican. Like, not even Latino, there were like two Puerto Rican kids. Like, this is Mexican, everyone's brown. And I was in the nerd class of AP students where we were all pretty diverse, but have you guys seen that episode of Blackish where the kid, the dad's trying to connect with his son and realize, oh, he's actually just a nerd. That's what this is. It's not that he's not like down for, you know, connecting culturally. So yeah, we were in the school that was all brown, but we were the ones reading Harry Potter. And you know, that's a whole different experience. So anyway, that, leaving that environment to go to Harvard was really jarring for me. I'd never been around such extreme privilege. Uh, I had a great experience for sure, but I had to learn how to navigate a totally different world. And so I was kind of getting used to that, right? How to show up and not hopefully be threatening, um, you know, just kind of quietly going to these spaces. But when I was an intern at Google, somebody asked, oh, excuse me, do you speak Spanish? And I knew they thought it was awkward. I'm like, yes, I speak Spanish. Like, they're not profiling me, it's fine. And she said, okay, cool. So we're doing this side project where we're translating ads, ad campaigns for brands that are advertising with us. Would you be interested in helping? I said, sure. So I had my side project, which was fine. I could have done it in like, three or four days, they didn't really scope it out well for a full internship, but I made that last long enough because I really liked this other thing I was doing. And so I was doing it kind of on the side because Google has what we call 20% time. And I thought, well, this will be like my 20% time where you do something outside your core role with 20% of your time, which is not really 80-20, it's more like 120%. And you go above me on. Gmail was someone's 20% project. Really, really cool things can come up that time. So at the end of my internship, I presented what I had done that summer, and I was like, yeah, here's what I did, da da da, my project, but here's what I loved, and I'm really excited about it. Since then, interns are no longer encouraged to do this because I kind of went rogue and just like made my internship, from, internship kind of again. But what I loved about it was that I got to bring a part of myself to Google that I never thought would be relevant. I didn't think that I'd be helping with ads, translating them, and one of the reasons it mattered was because everyone working on the project was very different backgrounds. Um, some people were like Colombian, Peruvian, some of them had just learned Spanish, studied abroad, but nobody was actually Mexican-American. And if you look at the demographics of Latinos in the US, Mexican-Americans are the largest percentage. So when you're typing in words and these ads are supposed to um, relate really specifically to what users are searching, the exact language matters. So they're asking me like, why are there all these ads for like diapers and wedding dresses and a lot of grills? And, and then what's the word you use for scarves, for example? So I was literally calling my mom, like, mom, how do we say scarf? It's bufanda, right? I think it's bufanda. She's like, yeah, let me check. Let me go abuelita and make sure. So my family is getting looped in on this. I never thought, I mean, imagine, I'm getting, I have this job at Google, and no one in my family has ever had a corporate job, and I'm calling about how abuelita says bufanda. <laughs> that's just like, you can't make it up, right? I never thought, no one prepared me for that at all. And I thought, like, that's kind of cool. I hope this is the right way to do it. I hope there's not like some other better way to translate things, but it worked. My family definitely came through and helped me. And then I had studied sociology undergrad, and my dad really didn't get it. How many of you are studying things and your parents don't know what it is? 
I told my dad I'm studying sociology, and he's like, are you gonna be a social worker? Like, what does that mean? I'm not opposed to it, just couldn't wrap his head around it. But I had carved out a space within sociology, and I studied sociology and economics. And so I was really fascinated by how people behave in ways that impact the economy. So, purchasing decisions. How does culture influence that? Is essentially where this went. And in this internship, because people were like, why are there so many ads for diapers that need to be translated? And I said, well, a lot of Latinos are Catholic. They have a lot of babies. So the diaper companies are aware that there's a lot of buying power for diapers among Latinos. Clearly that's what's happening. Wedding dresses. This is like over, or over representation of ads on wedding dresses. Okay, well, first of all, we have quinceaneras, which means we're usually buying dresses that are basically wedding dresses. And so that means that there's two moments in a girl's life for a dress like that. So there's actually more opportunity in selling these to Latinas. So I got to apply the sociology that I had learned, or the, the way of thinking of a sociologist. And I got to call my dad and was like, see, puppy, it was useful. Now I'm using it at Google. So the other thing, though, that I loved about that experience was that um, it actually came out of the real core role they had assigned to me. We were working with advertisers, people with small businesses that are advertising with Google Ads. And at first, I just thought, okay, I'll, I'll listen in on the calls and see how we can support them, et cetera. And I was just learning from my team. But I noticed that none of them were diverse. And most of them were men. And I thought, wait, these are small businesses, just like my family's? Because my family and I have a, it's an organic tequila company. Unfortunately, I didn't make samples. But we, uh, we started something as a family project that turned into a business. And I remember the day I had to beg my dad that we needed a website. Like, we have to have a website company. We really need this. And he's like, he has 20 things on his to-do list, that's gonna be at the bottom always. And so I had to make it, I'm not a coder, so I figured out how to hack it together on a blog spot back in the day. Anyway, so my point is that when I learned that all these advertisers were not as diverse as the community where I came from, but had similar businesses to, you know, the product can be different, but at the end of the day, it's like what, what tools are in your toolkit to help these business owners? And so at first I was like, what the hell, like why aren't we being included? I learned that you know, no one was necessarily excluding diverse businesses, but no one was thinking about it. Just people don't know what they don't know sometimes. So when I came back full time, I had talked to my recruiters and said, I like this internship in sales, but I really love learning about how this culture is created, this like, collaborative, pretty entrepreneurial culture uh, that feels like a startup, but it's massive at this point. I'd love to learn more about that. Because that's sort of like the sociology about how do you design a company. So they were really nice to me and they placed me at the intersection of both. They put me in sales HR. And my first role, and this is if you haven't had a job in corporate America yet or any entity, sometimes your first role is not that exciting. And I knew that, uh, actually in fact, I didn't know what job I was gonna get into. When I got my offer letter from Google, it didn't even say what department. It just said, we are you know, excited to offer you a job at Google. And my parents were like, what are you gonna do? I was like, I have no idea and they won't tell me, but I think that it's a cool enough company, the food is free, there's a lot of cool perks, and I'm around smart people. And even on the days that are kind of the low days, everyone has them, even if you have your, day, your, your dream job, there's, there can be some low points. And even on those days, I still liked it a lot, so I'm gonna accept and let's see what happens. So I didn't know I'd be in sales HR. I show up, and I'm basically an admin. And what's cool about admin roles is that you get to see everything, you learn a lot but I wasn't using any particular skill that I was prepared for. I wasn't like going into finance and doing Excel and knowing what you're doing. So I just had to kind of float around and see, like just kind of follow my manager and see how can I help on the team. And in that experience, uh, I connected with the vice president, who, well, my boss's boss, essentially. And she just found me interesting and she's like, hey, you do Hispanic things, right? And I was like, I don't know what that means, but um, yes, I guess I do do those things. Uh, because she had heard that I had, I was starting to gather Latinos at Google because there was sort of a network, but it was really an email list. And at the time, this was in 2010, diversity wasn't trendy yet. Now diversity in tech is such a big topic, but at the time, no one was really talking about it. And so we would email out and say, let's meet up, let's, like, where are you people, where are our people? But there was a lot of imposter syndrome. And if you haven't heard that phrase, it's thinking, you know, am I an imposter for being here? So people don't really want to meet up for margaritas on a Monday because they're like, I need to be at my desk doing my job. Because so many of us are either first gen or first to go corporate or first in many ways that job security is a really big deal for us. And it probably is for many people, but like really, truly important to us. So we, I got it. Like I knew that people just had other priorities and probably, man, there's no community though. And so 
because of this idea that small businesses like my family weren't represented, I thought, okay, what if I find other Latinos here that might be interested in helping me support small businesses? I was in sales as an intern for like three months, so I wasn't an expert at using the tools, but I understood how they functionally work. So I can talk about it, I can design a strategy, but maybe there's some people here who actually work in those teams that can help me. So I found Adriana, I found Danny, and all these different people, and at first I, I connect with them, and okay, or like you, for example, what's your name? Juan. So I'd say, okay, Juan, what do you wish you could do? Like outside of your day job, if you could do anything, what would you do? And maybe you said, um, I really want to connect with kids that like soccer. And I'd be like, am I kind of right? Just kidding. He's like, oh, how do you know? Figure it out. So I was like, okay, so what if we were to do like a soccer clinic where we, we, we play with kids doing soccer, but then while they're playing, while some of us are entertaining the kids, we have other people working with the parents to help them learn about using computers, maybe support their small business, like help them think about using digital tools. So we have some kind of connecting into how do we impact people directly without looking like we're this corporate company coming in, but we want to connect with people and help them. So we started doing little workshops here and there to find small businesses we could help. And we really, really loved it. And we thought, I don't think anyone's doing this. And again, I had to check because I thought, okay, well, if, some, if somebody is doing it, I don't want to impose and step on their toes. I had learned about being appropriate and sending them emails. And so I remember once I got feedback on my, another internship I did where my boss had to tell me to put bullet points in an email because I just sent like chunks of text, like novels in an email. So learning how to write a good email is a very important skill to develop. Definitely look that up. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was learning how to communicate internally, how to navigate this organization, and I started emailing around who's doing small business efforts. And um, there were teams who were looking at that for sure, but no one with the lens of diversity. So I thought, you know what? I did my due diligence. I looked around and I tried to connect. I tried to find a team that would be doing this work, but it sounds like they're not there. And so we can be that team. And so when before I might have been upset, now I thought, okay, I can't get mad that they're not doing this work. I have to get strategic. Because that's an opportunity, now I get to do that work, which was awesome. It's like, who doesn't want more work, right? But more than that, who doesn't want more work that can make an impact? So anyway, so through that, we created OLA, which stands for the Hispa it's a Hispanic Opportunities in Leadership and Advertising Time. We thought, we're going to be a business consulting group, and we're going to advise teams. So we started with collaborating with a small business team. Then we evolved into working with the uh, policy team, working with nonprofits. And then we started getting into education. So now we have like six different pillars. And it started with five of us. And I was sort of supporting in the way that Juan told me his passion. And I was trying to align it to his interests so that it would help him further professionally. It was one of those conversations, and then five. And then now I have 75 people that I'm part of managing in these 20% roles. And it was awesome. And I loved it. And it was so exhausting, but I loved it. And so when that VP asked me, are you doing Hispanic things? I was like, maybe she's heard about it, I guess. Yeah. So she's like, well, we need help hiring in Latin. Do you think you could help us find talent? I was like, sure. They had identified kind of the wrong problem. And I thought, actually, it's not about trying to find people from the US to bring them to Latin. It's about developing talent there. So this began my journey of creating roles from scratch. This is kind of like my, my, my hustle within Google. Um, I've been there nine years, I just had my nine year Google bursary, and I've created four roles from scratch, which is not common. When interns come to visit, they're like, I'm gonna come and make my own role. I'm like, I did get to do it, and I do think it's possible, but it's not always super common. Being an entrepreneur is something that I think I gravitated for because I've always been, I, at six years old, I started selling coffee and cookies at the neighborhood garage sales. Like, you know, when you have that hustle from when you're little, it's kind of always with you. But I also was able to navigate this environment, asking the right questions, and really piloting things to prove concept. So in the way that I piloted these little workshops here and there, it was doing well. We were really making an impact. We were gathering all these stories and case studies. So then I went to the small business marketing team, the, the vice president there, and I said, if I did this with 20% of my time, imagine what I could do with a little bit of budget first. So she said yes. And we pitched a project, and we got a substantial amount of money to build a bilingual website and make bilingual case studies of Latino small businesses that are using the tools, and they're the hero. It's not about the product. Their story, they're amazing. And so with those side projects here and there, that's how I was able to prove concept for what I really wanted to do. So I did this Latin role where I essentially created this role with this VP to support Latin America. And in that role was when I really dove into Ola. And it grew so fast because it was like, people didn't want to show up for margarita mixers, but they definitely wanted to make an impact. 
And they wanted to feel connected to each other through that. And I realized that if you co-create together, that's when you bond, that's when you learn, and that's actually when you're more invested to show up. Because now we're in this together and we believe in it. How are we not gonna show up for this versus, you don't really need it. Okay, unless it's margaritas, it might be that. You don't really need them, right? It's optional. So anyway, so I joined the diversity team later and uh, started that role, I'll focus on business development. So I was kind of under the radar from marketing, but collaborating with them, co-owning projects. Finally, an executive in the marketing and said, when are you gonna come do this whole time in marketing? And I was like, I don't know, but it's bureaucratic. And like, I like kind of just doing my thing and I like being able to move fast, I don't wanna be slowed down. And who would I even work for? There's so many layers of marketing, I don't know, I'm really skeptical. I, I sounded like I was playing hard to get, but I really was not about it. And she said, you'll come work for me directly. And I said, okay, what's my job description? And she said, let's write it together. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna give this a shot. We'll see how it goes. So that was six years ago, I think. That's when I started the multicultural marketing team. And I used to say, we are the multicultural marketing team, and it was just me. And I hope that one day there'd be more than just me. And eventually, we grew. And through those efforts, we launched so many different initiatives to help get kids to code, to promote small business tools, to really consulting across products to make sure that our communities have access. To me, that's really what it's about, access. How are we advocating for underrepresented groups that have access to technology so our communities don't fall behind? So that those teams that are managing um, small businesses that are advertising, that those are diverse. That the people that are creating content on YouTube are not, they don't all look the same. Because Latinos, African Americans, we actually consume more content on YouTube than any other demographics. We're consumers, are we creators? So how are we putting our voices out there, telling our stories, building our businesses, and so forth? I get really excited about it. I just felt like I got really warm because I feel like I heat flash every time I talk about it because I love it so much. And one of the reasons that I started telling the story publicly more because I realized that a lot of us think that just getting the job is hard. Right? Oh my God, I don't know anyone on the inside. How do I do it? Well, you guys have learned all day. You've met people, you can reach out on LinkedIn, you can shoot them an email, there's so many ways you can reach out. Once you do, then what? Right? Are you gonna be prepared for when they ask, how can I help you, like I asked Amber? Because that executive who recruited me into marketing, I had reached out to her two years prior to be the executive sponsor of Ola, and she said, what do you need? And I was like, mm, $70,000. And I made up a number, and she said, okay. And that was our budget for Ola, to do all our projects. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know she was just gonna spin it on me like that. So I got to do that to Amber. And another year later, when I was telling her, let's partner on the small business marketing initiatives, I'm in diversity, but I wanna work with your team. And she said, okay, what do you need? Uh, 300,000 and two people to help me and da da da. And I had prepared a little bit where I had a sense for it because now I'm asking for more money, right? So if you're gonna make an ask, are you prepared to back that up with a why? I said, okay, that's gonna go toward hiring an agency to just on this website, the film crew to film these uh, case studies, et cetera. And so, once I joined full time in marketing, I had to be ready to ask for what I needed or wanted at any moment. And I needed to be ready with the data to prove it, because people, the more you ask and the higher you rise, people will become more skeptical. Really, the, the, the bar is that much higher. So, at first I thought, why don't they just believe me? Why do I need to make a whole deck for it? And I would resent that I had to do this work to defend myself. And as well, I'm asking for resources. So, it makes sense, right? So, Part of this also stems from one of the first people I emailed back to Harvard in this organization. I thought she was like a PR person. I had emailed one of the co-founders of MTV Press. Like I accidentally reached really, really high. And she has become one of my closest, most inspiring and impactful mentors of my life. And she has introduced me to so many people along the way. Because you never know who's gonna take that email. You never know who's gonna respond. It's worth taking the chance. And you know what? If you email 100 people and only one respond, that one person may be a ride or die and may take you along in, the, in whatever direction you're hoping. They may be the one that say, how can I help you, what do you need? So one, are you ready? Two, are you taking the chance of just emailing, right? And then three, once you get there, once the first goal is met of like, maybe you get the job, maybe you get the interview, whatever that first thing is, then what's the next point? Because unfortunately, a lot of people we aim so high, and then once we're there, people, it's like we all, who here has had a goal and then you achieved it, and then you're like, okay, now what? So always thinking of how are we expanding our thought process, how are we expanding our curiosities and the things we want to accomplish. 
because when we get to that next level, it keeps expanding. So I have no doubt that every person in this room, just because you're here today on a Saturday, that's incredible. Do you know how many people are not here on a Saturday? A lot. Do you know how many, how many people are here and did not make the connections you did? A whole lot too. And you know what? Maybe you didn't talk to somebody who you saw speak. Maybe we don't get to connect today. But you can Google me. You can all find me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, literally every platform. I'm not on TikTok yet. My niece may make the video. But other than TikTok, I'm pretty much anywhere you can find me. And maybe you tell me, hey, I didn't get to come up and chat, but I'd love to connect with you because you've said this, which resonated, right? Say, show the people that you were listening. Because I can relate because I have a, a beat on Antonov Smart, or I also have one, I want to have a song business, or, or I have one, or whatever. Find some point of connection. And maybe you could also do a little bit of research and find out more about it. There's so many parts of my story I didn't get to tell you today. And I'm, how am I on time, guys? Good? How much time do I have left? Okay, awesome. That's about what I was feeling. Cool. Um, there's so much information you can find on the internet about the people you want to connect with. And let's say I miss your email. I don't get back to you. Just so you know, a lot of times when you email people and they don't respond, it is so not personal. I've had so many people reach out where I just totally miss it, and then they confront me at events. <laughs> That's always a little intimidating. Because um, sometimes life gets, gets hectic, gets crazy. Sometimes spam filters happen, so just know that. Just, I just want you guys to feel confident in that if you reach out, know that if the, if you're going to connect with the right people if it's meant to be. And if they don't respond, don't just hate them. Instead, think, okay, well, I can still learn from them, right? You can still research them, you can still learn so much about them. Don't let that get you down, don't let that stop you from reaching out to somebody else. So let's say you reach out to me and you say, hey, I learned that you uh, took culinary classes in Paris. That's in somewhere in my little bio somewhere. And you could say, I would love to do that. Do you have a recommendation? Uh, because I actually compete in competitive culinary arts, let's just say, because I did that in high school. And I'm interested in aligning my interest in food with having like a pop-up business, like, I don't know where it'll go. You can tell me all types of things. But just make that connection and offer something that you learned about what they, who they are and what they do. And that's really what served me in a lot of these situations. And one of the things I've loved to do, and I mean it genuinely, when there's someone that I'm like, I just want to learn from them in any way. One of the best ways to learn from someone is to offer to help. And I've had a lot of people reach out and say, hey, I know you're busy. I'd love to get on a call, but what if you have a need for help? I'm happy to help you with, these are my skills. If you ever need someone to help with social media, graphic design, anybody here that wants to help me with any of my 10,000 projects, feel free to let me know. Love help, and I will make sure that you grow through it. I'm not, this isn't my pitch, I'm not here to pitch for, for recruiting talent, <laughs> recruiting interns. But I did that with a couple different people, and it served me so much, because I was able to really learn from them, but also show them what I was capable of. Sometimes when I didn't even know what that was, and then we had a real dynamic relationship. So anytime Amber asks me for anything, I'll say yes, because we had a connection, introduced her to some people, she is amazing at her job and she's grown through it, and now I know that if I ever had a meeting where I need to throw Amber in, say, hey, I have a partner, I think they could sponsor LCF, what do you think? Jump in there, I can't be there, do you want to take the meeting? She can crush it. I have a couple different people that have offered to help me with projects, and now it's like, when there's a role opportunity that is so per perfect for them, I throw the most, I really do try to take care of my people and write really, really great letters of recommendation and just like, I like taking care of the people who take care of me. So how are you taking care of the people that take care of you? How are you showing gratitude to people and how are you paying it forward? So just to take a second because we're about to wrap up, can we just say thank you, everyone at once. Thank you, Digital Nest. Thank you, Digital Nest. Really, really good. There's a reason you're here right now. This space was created. Martin was telling me that five years ago they never would have imagined this would have been created, ever. And we just showed up, right? Like, oh, it's so cool, it's so nice. But we don't know the hard work that went behind the scenes for weeks, months to prepare for this. And what's also amazing is that groups like Digital Nest and hopefully other groups you encounter, they're not doing it for this full auditorium. They're doing this for fun. And what's your name? Ryan, they're doing this for Ryan. They're doing it for every single one of us. Yes, collectively we're so, we're pretty proud. But they're doing it for every single one of us because if there's one person in this room that makes the future Uber, cool. 
the future Google, Facebook, cool. That would be amazing. But what if there's someone here who creates the next Microsoft, the next whatever, small business, and really pays it forward and comes back to contribute and makes an impact? Like Those are the amazing stories that I think we all live for, is that we're creating spaces, platforms, and opportunities for people to shine, but how are we taking it upon ourselves to make sure we're paying it forward, we're reaching back, and we're not forgetting where we're from? So this moment for me has made me really grateful for being from Oxnard, even though everyone's like, you're from Oxnard? I'm like, yeah, 805 till I die. <laughs> and I said EMC square. That's what I'll end on that. E was Eliana, that's my story, I had to tell that. M is my theme. C is Carlos, who is a, a person I didn't tell you much about, but he is my sister's friend from high school. He ended up moving in with us because he had a kind of a rocky at home situation. And he's an example to me of how you just really can't underestimate people because, because I went to Harvard and we thought no one could do it. My mom's like, well, well, Carlos is smart. Let's put him in honors classes. Just kind of like a surrogate mom just helping. Oh, all of a sudden he's visiting Harvard too. And now he went to Harvard and he got the Gates Millennium Scholarship and all he wanted to do was graduate from high school. And you know what? He's the best example I have of someone who came back home because now he's renting a room from my mom. He's a grown man now, but he's, he's kind of a roommate. He is the chemistry teacher at my high school. In the class that I took, he teaches all levels, but I was in chemistry AP with six of us and they almost shut down the class. And my mom said, you can't shut this down because then no one can ever take it again. So he took it, he's back teaching it. So I encourage you to go as far as you can but don't forget to reach back. You don't have to move back if you don't choose to, but just don't forget where you come from because you never know when it'll be relevant. I never thought talking about my family small business would be relevant as a company like Google. And the last C was for capital, because apparently Watsonville thinks it's the strawberry capital of the country, but I don't think you guys realize that it's Oxnard, <laughs> actually. Anyway, um, I just, I really feel that connection. Rob and I still, it's a rivalry, and I think maybe technically it might be Watsonville, but I grew up going to the strawberry festival my whole life. And so just, just a reminder for you guys, these little moments matter. You know, I was advising a, a company called Square, a little swipe thing, and I pitched Oxnard Strawberry Festival as a potential activation space for them, and they went for it. So just don't overlook where you're from or things around you. Reach out to each other, network across, Issa Ray's line, network across. And uh, I can't wait to hopefully see your DMs at In My Element on Instagram, I-N-M-Y-E-L-I-M-U-T. Element with an I instead of the second name. And um, yeah, when you think you are afraid to reach out, do it anyway, see what happens. Thank you guys. I know, I felt like I was just walking away. Was, yes. We didn't have a conversation. I know, I'm sure some of you have some like, burning questions. Does anybody? anybody? Yes. I love them. Okay. If you're driving from Marina this way, the new bridge that's off the Salinas Road exit has a strawberry in, like, on the bridge. So we are the strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've eaten more strawberries than I have. I don't know. There's oh, yeah. just other ways to measure this. Have you tried strawberry pizza? Absolutely. Have you had strawberry nachos? <laughs> Okay, it might be possible, and you guys are great. Don't tell her I said that. Any other questions or comments? Nobody. Okay, somebody right there lecture. Like I drove an hour out to get here, ask me some questions. How do I turn it on? I don't know. Okay, I'll just talk. Yeah. Hey, Elena. My name is Oscar. Question: How nervous were you when? Yeah, uh, uh, Google approached you and wanted to talk to you. Um, yeah. Well, I think there's only like 100 VPs at Google. Out of like 90 million, 90 thousand people. That's great. Um, I think I was kind of in shock that. Well, okay, so I think I wasn't super nervous because I built a relationship with her in advance of that. Um, I, I made she was going to be on this at this event, and so I kind of like said a little something and then followed up and then she remembered me so then that moment when it was not so much nervousness as much a shock that i couldn't believe that through building up this little relationship that now we got to the point where she was pitching me a job and i was like does she even know what i can do like like does she need to see my resume is this allowed and uh, technically i had to apply into marketing fair and square and then once i got there then she said let's use the headcount you know you got the headcount we'll, we'll frame the role however you want so i think the nervousness was avoided because i found these ways to stay relevant i found things she's interested in i 
kind of center articles or things I had done. I kind of do check in sort of like never did. Um, but I think that shock was, it was crazy. Because honestly, I thought I still had to do so much more to prove myself. And you just never know when people are watching. Sometimes they already, they already got the proof points they needed. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'll go first. This is like kind of a three-part question. Um, you mentioned hustling and always like keeping uh, all the projects you've talked about, get, getting communities together. How do you keep that hustle? When do you know um, you're close to a burnout? And uh, when do you, uh, how do you balance the hustle and the time to kind of decompress and um, kind of either push your hobbies or kind of like give that um, yeah, decompressing space for, uh, for yeah. you? Okay, so how do you kind of keep the hustle alive and stay inspired and how do you deal with near burnout? Um, I, I, I'll answer with what I usually say, but I'll, I'll be thoughtful. I usually tell people, I really focus on my why. Like, why am I doing this? And really that usually means, who am I doing this for? Because my mom always raised me with the idea, she, she said, in everything you do, who are you helping? And so often when I'm down, like head down in the work, and I'm in the documents, like in the very formal parts, like bringing the work to life and, and legitimizing the hustle, that can feel almost sterile and boring for me. So I'm not super excited about that part of like the structural parts of it and the process parts. And then I go into community and I talk to the business owners, I talk to the students, and I actually, humanize it again, and I'm like, oh my god, how am I not gonna do this? Like, these people need it, and I'm in a position to help. How am I not gonna do this? And it just reawakens me completely, because there are totally moments when I'm like, I'm in this thing I like, kind of like, so I'm just tired, and like, I have all these things going on, um, which ones is, uh, not deserve my attention, but like, where do I feel most engaged? Because sometimes you need those reminders, so I definitely prioritize that, and other people around me, I can tell when they're starting to like lose that, Fire, like, have you re-engaged? When's the last time you went and talked to somebody? Because there are real needs we can solve. And when you realize that, it's like we're doing a disservice to them by not doing what we can do. So that's one. Um, I think the second part of like, how do you stay inspired? Um, maybe uh, with many different projects. Um, I just love multitasking. I love having a lot of things on my plate. It's not for everyone. Some people really need to focus on one thing. And I think right now, there's sort of this obsession with like, have a side hustle and like, do a lot of things. And that's more my def my default mode, but some people are like, no, I have to go fully focus on one. So what I would say is find what works for you, and also don't impose your judgment on anybody else who has a different work style. Because people really were hard on me for a long time and said, why don't you just do one thing really well? Like that was the measure of being legit professional. And I felt like, oh, is there something wrong with me that I like can't just do one thing? I need at least two or 50 tabs open. Um, <laughs> and, just because it doesn't work for somebody else doesn't mean it doesn't work for you. So that's two. On the third one, on burnout, um, it's real. My mentor, who I mentioned, has been in my life and made a huge impact in my life. She said, you will burn out. And it's, it's sort of the quote, right? It's not about how you fall, it's how you get back up. She didn't say, do these things to avoid it. She was like, oh, you're going to grind, you're going to work super hard, you're going to be all about it, and all of a sudden you're going to be getting sick, you're going to be tired, and you're not going to see your friends as much, and you're going to be like, what do I do with my life, and how do I get myself out of it? Um, and so I went through a very difficult time once where literally my body was shutting down. I lost my voice for three months. I could barely type from basically pre carpal tunnel. And I had to take some time off of work. I don't recommend that to anybody in terms of like going that far. Uh, because I just felt like, oh, my voice is gone. It'll come back. Oh, my hands kind of hurt. It'll be fine. So don't ignore the signs. <laughs> because they're real. Your body's telling you things. Um, don't ignore when people around you maybe say like, hey, you're kind of being short with me. Or like, you're not really showing up anymore. Like people. Hopefully people who love you will tell you. Um, I had a moment, I was like crying at my mom's house, all these things were just like all at once happening and she's like, do you need this right now? Like, is this worth it? And I was like, okay, reality check, I'm letting this get to me too much. But yes, it is worth it. I just need to reassess and recalibrate how I'm handling it. But I will say that self-care is a practice that I now have learned to prioritize in a way that my community does not advocate for. Like, Telling my family I try to get a massage once a week, they're like, are you crazy? What a waste of money. Like, that's insane. And that's like a luxury no one should even, even if you can afford it, you can't justify it. Uh, that's, that's if I'm really taking care of myself, not necessarily always the case. So I think that I'm learning to not always operate zero or a hundred trillion thousand percent. Like, I live in extremes. And often, I try to tell myself, like, let me just aim for like 50%. What does that even look like? And recently someone told me, what about like a 30 to 70 approach? Where there's some days you need to ramp it up, some days you need to kind of tone it down, but don't be at zero where you have a cold and you can't function. 
I used to have a pattern where I get I get a full, I get sick, I'd be out for three days, and I'd watch Kane Arnold for three days, and then I'd to shut down. I grew up with Kane Arnold and Nickelodeon growing up, and uh, I would shut down, and then I'd be back back at it. But it was because my body needed rest, and so that's on a physical level. Obviously, there's a lot of psychological things there too. Last thing related to this is I have coaches. I've hired coaches over the years. Um, I think that had I not met one randomly, I wouldn't have pursued it. But it's helped me a lot. So if, if a coach helps you, if therapy, just whatever you can, find those people. And if anyone here thinks that there's a stigma, this is a negative thing, it's not actually at all. And it feels like indulgent, it feels like a strategic advantage. And it feels like you've got a team of people that are helping you be your best. Because I come from a place where nobody talks about mental health, nobody talks about therapy, it's really taboo. And it's not a, um, it doesn't have to mean privilege. It can just mean taking care of yourself because we need all of you to last a very, very long time. We have time for one more question. I saw that hand go up over there. Hi, thank you for speaking for us. Um, it's a really great pleasure to meet you. Uh, I just have a quick question on, so two years ago you were trying to join the Harvard Association Board of Directors. I was wondering why you applied and um, well, um, what did you learn from applying? Um, yeah, so I actually have nominated. I was notified that I was, so for everyone to hear the backstory, I was notified that I was nominated to join the Harvard Alumni Association. I can't remember the full title now. And so, I could choose to run, essentially, and get elected. And so I was like, okay, sure, like it seems interesting. They said, they basically said like, like run, and then if you're elected, then we'll kind of tell you what really goes down, kind of. So I was like, okay, I'm not really sure exactly what they do, but it sounds cool. So I ran, and I didn't win, but it was a good experience, actually, because so many people showed up and said they were supportive. Um, what I learned through it was that a lot of older folks vote, a lot of alumni, and my generation actually had no, I didn't even know this thing existed, None of my friends did. I'm not trying to be a sore loser and say, like, well, my friends didn't even know and they couldn't vote. But it was interesting to me to see how there was a process for a very old institution that is, has, has a, obviously a legacy and all that. Um, but the process wasn't designed. I'm really big on design, how a process is designed. And so in this case, it wasn't designed in a way that, like, I told all my friends, you got this email. And they're like, well, where is it? They didn't, it was like a lot of confusion around it. And so I remember thinking, okay, if I don't win, it's okay. Because one, I'm not fully sure what it's about, it just sounds cool, and I, I want to get back. And two, if I were to win, I, I want to redesign this process so that everyone knows about how to vote and like what's involved and how do you get younger generations to actually participate. So um, yeah, so I didn't like randomly seek it out. I was, I was surprised by the nomination. And I'm, I think that'll always be really special to me, that there was somebody out there, I don't know who, who nominated me. I'm mean, like, all, people, my seniors by like 40. So that was cool to at least be thrown in the hat for someone at my age. Thank you guys for the questions. <laughs>